Howdy, everybody. I tell you, let's do, let's have a Bible class. I knew that's why you showed up. Turn, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Talking about the mysteries, the mysteries that were revealed to, through, and by the Apostle Paul, and the reason for them to be revealed to, through, and by Paul, and so forth. And today I want to talk to you about the mystery of godliness. So let's read here in verse, begin with me in verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, that's a great tall order of the mystery of godliness. There are six aspects of it here. God's manifest in the flesh. God is justified uh, in the spirit. Um, see, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the mystery of godliness was God manifest in the flesh. Just the mystery of godliness is uh, justified in the spirit. The mystery of godliness is seen of angels. The mystery of godliness is preached unto the Gentiles. The mystery of godliness was believed on in the world. And the mystery of godliness is received up into glory. Now you got to put all those things together and see what, how that would fit into scripture or else you will not really be defining the mystery of godliness. I'll grant everyone the privilege of their own um, uh, uh, opinion about some of this because you can make several different things apply to several of those aspects of the mystery of godliness uh, every time you do it. I mean, it's just kind of like that. But you'll notice here he calls in verse 15, he refers to Timothy as being uh, thou, that how thou oughtest to be say to behave thyself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, I believe that the word and there, being a conjunction, draws those two uh, explanations together. And as such, the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, is connected to the form known as the mystery of godliness. Grammatically, if I'm wrong, send, write me a letter and tell me grammatically why I'm wrong about that. And maybe I'll believe you. Maybe I'll take it to my own grammar experts, you know what I mean? But in other words, the whole I'm trying to get you to understand here about this is that without controversy, great is the mystery of God. You know, a while ago, about an hour ago, I, I looked online to see, I, thought, I wonder what Google will put up about mystery of godliness. Well, it put up a lot of religious sites. One of them, one of the biggest, it kept popping up on every page. It was practically on every one of those pages that I turned to, was uh, uh, something to do with Mormons. I don't know why. I've read the Mormon doctrines, and uh, I can tell you that that's not a mystery, and it's not certainly not the mystery of godliness. But nevertheless, uh, neither is any other churchism. They don't fit. And the reason they don't fit is because the, the things they say and the things they do about themselves. Well, this is what the Bible is talking about here. We're not talking about Jerry or even rightly dividers or even dispensational truth uh, patterns or any such thing as that. But you are talking about what the scripture says here. And this takes all of the scripture for us to see what a great mystery this was. Great is the mystery of godliness. Now, in, uh, in seeing those things uh, online there a while ago, I also saw some what some versions of the Bible do. And a, 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 I didn't recognize all of the initials and the names for the Bibles. I don't pay a lot of attention to that. But there was about six different versions, and they started verse 16 with the term, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. Or there is a greatness to this mystery, or some such thing as that. By common confession, 
That makes it sort of sound like you're doing a, a ritual, doesn't it? By common confession, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. It's strange to me what people want to do with simple words out of the English language. So I don't pay much attention to those things. The reason for me to draw your attention to them is that none of them saw it as I see it in the scripture. None of those versions saw it, nor the, nor the explanations of it saw it the way I see it. So if you think I'm wrong, you can just uh, check this one off. Just mark the X across this video and you don't have to watch it anymore. But let's take a look at some things. You know, there's several things that church isms think that um, that they are participating in. In fact, people who believe that they are in the church, the body of Christ, many times will also believe something like this: that that we today are a picture of spirit, spiritual Israel. I want to tell you something about spiritual Israel. Spiritual Israel. There isn't one. There's, there's no spiritual Israel in the scripture. No spiritual Israel. Simple as that. Well, you see, there's the people that are, are spiritual in Israel. Well, you could call the kingdom of heaven that. You could. The kingdom of heaven of H is spiritual until it becomes a reality and it hasn't yet the kingdom of heaven has not become a reality yet and so you could call it spiritual but then again all of those people in that spiritual Israel called the kingdom of heaven that spiritual group they're dead they died, probably all of them in the first century. They were there with the 12 apostles. They were there with the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. They were with the 5,000 more a little bit later. They were there in Acts chapter 15. They were gathered together in Acts chapter 21, and that's the last time you hear from them. Last time. So, well, what? Did they get swallowed up by somebody else? No, they were the kingdom of heaven. The 12 apostles? led those people to be the kingdom of heaven. Say, well, what happened to them? I don't know, but my guess would be, Jerry's making a guess. My guess would be that they died in the destruction of Jerusalem uh, in, in AD 70. I don't know, but I know they're not still here. Therefore, it has never yet become a reality, but it's no longer spiritual because those folks are passed away. That's the kingdom of heaven. Now, here's the other thing. There's another group that wants to call, and many people do this pretty, pretty, uh, it's pretty common in evangelical people who fail to see that the Apostle Paul was the first person saved into the body of Christ. All you people have been bothering me about that. Listen up. If Paul said he was the first one saved by the method he said he was saved by, and he's the first one to preach that gospel, you got to quit saying he wasn't the first one in the body of Christ. Christ was the first one in, of course, because he's the head, but he's not here. He, on the earth, the apostle Paul was the first person saved into the body of Christ. That's plain as a nose on your face, so don't bug me about it anymore. Now, what these what many evangelicals do, though, is they latch on to something, and they call themselves the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is fairly common. The church, which is his bride, they say. Well, let me tell you something. That's not a Bible term either. The bride of Christ does not exist in your Bible. So you can just mark them off too, like you can spiritual Israel. The bride of Christ, the bride of Christ. Well, let's see something. You want to know what the bride is? That's fairly plain. I, all of you who might have had occasion to believe that the church was the bride, just I just I, I'm not trying to make anybody any angrier than the one I've already made people, but um, but I want you to look at the bride of Christ here. Uh, the bride is not called the bride of Christ. 
turn with you with me to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Verse 1. It's John, uh, the revelator, writing this. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, there's the only place this um, this terminology can come from, and it's a the, the first one that it can come from in the sense of the bride adorned for her husband. Now, later in this chapter, this gets fully described. Look, if you will, in verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, uh, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city. Did he say, wait, verse 9, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Did nobody say it? Yes, yes, nod your head, yes. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. How smart would you have to be to say that the bride, the lamb's wife, was the holy, the great city, the holy Jerusalem? You wouldn't have to be smart at all because that's what the scripture said. And watch this, verse 11, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. That's a pronoun for a woman. Now, I know that's very confusing today, so don't worry about that. But it's a, it's a pronoun about a woman, her light. Who was she? She was that great city the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. If you don't want to believe that, don't believe it. But that's what it said. You could just, out of the goodness of your heart, just believe what it said, I suppose. Yes, I suppose you actually could. Why not? Her light. Hmm. My. Well, if you go and read that description, you'll find that that is a beautiful, beautiful thing for the Lord to be in possession of. And by the way, look at verse 22. As John looked at that city, he said, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. If the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it, and the city has, he goes on to say, has no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. I mean, doesn't that make sense about the city being the bride? Those attributes? No? Hmm. Wow. Those to me, I don't find any contradiction in any of that. We're talking about God Almighty here, folks. We're talking about the Lamb who was worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. We're talking about how they are going to handle God the Father, God the Son, how they're going to handle eternity. Okay. I don't know what percentage it might be, but I'd say probably there's some people right now that are saying, that don't make much sense, make the city out to be the bride. Well, you can say that if you want to, but you're going to have to argue with the King James Bible about it in Revelation chapter 21, because that's what he said. That's what he said. So, since bride of Christ is not a terminology, and there is no spiritual Israel, unless you call it the kingdom of heaven, they all died in the first century, and they have not been revived yet. They're going to be revived in the future. That's a fact. They're going to be a reality, but they won't be spiritual. They'll be physical. Even though they'll be in heavenly bodies, they'll be like you and me, only they're going to be on the earth. 
So all I'm trying to get you to see is sometimes the terminology associated with the mystery of godliness gets really skewered because of what people believe the church, which is the church today, should be accounted as. For some reason, they like the idea of it having a female appellation, and that won't work with Ephesians chapter 4. Turn back there to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians 4, there is a, there is a process that goes on here. And the process does not allow for you and me to think of the group of people that Paul is preaching to as being female. The reason it doesn't is because of words. Words mean something, do they not? Of course they do. Are words worthy of paying attention to? Yes, they are. Why? The Lord chose to tell us this story. Instead of putting it in pictures or paintings or whatever, don't send me letters about the paintings. But the Lord told, told us words. Now notice what he says here. Uh, after the gifts given unto men, and it's, it boils down to what you and I have in our hands right now, and you and I have as available to us as uh, are the evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now look at verse 12. I'm in Ephesians 4, verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. Does it say perfecting? Yes, it does. Does that mean that there's things that are done by the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers because of the apostles and prophets, and now the evangelists, pastors, and teachers are things being done that would bring about, that could bring about the perfecting of the saints? Well, of course it does. Keep reading. For the work of the ministry, then we know what the saints are for, for the overall total picture of the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. To be edified is to be built up, the body of Christ, to be built up. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. We've got to change, folks. We're going to be changed by all of this perfecting of the saints that takes place, whether it does now take place or whether it takes place when we go to be with the Lord, we are going to come unto a perfect man. Hmm. Fascinating. A perfect man. That'd be us. Okay? Now, so in all of this, we have come, basically what I did there, we have come to the point where we can see what the mystery of godliness is not. But we do have some things yet to look at what it is. It is not a replacement Israel. That's a theological point that's never been taken care of. Because Israel does, Israel has great and precious promises from Abraham forward, from uh, Jacob forward, and all the way down through the, uh, the time that's in the Bible, plus the time that's yet to come. There are great and precious promises for those people on the basis of what God promised from the beginning, okay? So there's, there's not any point of, of, uh, of referring to anybody today as being replacement Israel. There remains then... An explanation of something that needs to be taken care of right at this very minute. Notice, if you will, in Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. I want to remind you of something on the, on the book of Acts framework here. This is Acts chapter 2 here. We'll put that downward thing like the Holy Spirit. That's a 2. And then we're out here, at the, as the Apostle Paul was saved, Saul was saved in Acts 9. Uh, he goes to preach uh, in some other places in Acts 13 first. And now uh, when, we, when he uh, wrote the book that we're looking at, Galatians, he was in chapter 16. Okay? Now, look here in Galatians chapter 6. He says here, um, verse 12. Beginning in verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer for the cross of Christ. The idea being that there were some people trying to get uh, the Galatians to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses. You may remember that from uh, Acts chapter four, at the end of Acts chapter 14, at the beginning of Acts chapter 15, and uh, Paul would not allow that to occur, so he and Barnabas and, and Mark uh, went to Jerusalem 
and uh, told the, the, the uh, apostles what all they were doing. And the apostles agreed that they would not have, they should not teach uh, circumcision and, and keeping of the law, and these other people should stay out of their hair. I know I just shortened that a lot, but nevertheless, that's what had happened. But Paul says there's people that want to change you about this. Now read with me from verse 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. <clears throat> now what? For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Now who's the they and who are the you in the passage? Well, the they is might be controversial, but you're in Acts 16. From Acts 2 forward, this group of people right here, they had they had people who were scattered, and some and many churches of, of Judea. Uh, were started by these people, many churches away from Jerusalem. They were started by these people. But then they had some that were scattered abroad, and Paul, it seems, runs into some of them in Acts 13 and 14, and then they showed up in Acts chapter 15 at the end of the chapter there, trying to get people to be circumcised and keep the law. Now, before we read any further in chapter 6, go back to chapter 1, Galatians 1. Verse 6, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that would that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. You remember the gospel of Christ is how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised for our justification. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You can find that Paul speaking part of that in 16. He spoke part of it in 13, and he wrote it all down in Acts chapter 19 when he wrote 1 Corinthians. But here's the thing. In 13, he said, through Jesus Christ, through this man, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin, the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that are, that, uh, uh, don't you know, I would not remember that at exactly the right time. So let me go back there and read it. I, I hate myself about, about the memory, but I also understand that it's going to happen, so I have to deal with it. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. You see, the secret is about salvation is not about what you do or don't do. It's what you believe or don't believe. That's what Paul just got through saying. In Acts chapter 13. So in Acts chapter 16, he's writing the Galatians along the same lines. And in effect, it was the part of the Galatian group that he said that to in 13. And so now he's telling, he's reiterating this to them in Galatians chapter 1. He says in verse 7 that, that they would be some people that would pervert the gospel of Christ. Then he says... But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Well, I know that, go back to chapter 6 now, I know that Paul knew a lot of people in Jerusalem. You can tell by the way he wrote, by the way he went there, the, the people that he uh, gathered himself to when he was there, and so forth. In Acts chapter 12, he had taken, uh, 11 and 12, he had taken a gift from the Antioch church over to Jerusalem and uh, uh, and then would, had gone back to Antioch and been sent out on the mission field. Now here's the thing. When you come to Galatians chapter 6 verse um, 12 and 13, there's people doing something wrong there about the gospel of Christ, about the cross of Christ, and it's like he put them into that category of chapter 1 verse 8 and 9. Although he doesn't specifically put them in that category and call them accursed. He says, anybody preaches another gospel is, called, is going to be accursed, however. Now, back in chapter 6, he says, they want a glory in your flesh, verse 13 said. Then he said in verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Now, think that and keep that in mind. Look back in chapter 3 at the end of it. At the end of chapter 3, in verse 28, 
he said, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, everyone he was preaching to in Galatia was in, uh, if he accounts them as being in Christ, and obviously it's based on their personal testimony, but when he accounts them as being in Christ, they're not part of Israel. They're not part, they're not men, they're not women, they're not uh, they're not uh, uh, bond or free, None, nothing like that. There's no Jew and Gentile. And so when he gets over here, he recognizes, makes a recognition that there is a group whom he knew from this group right here. He knew they were still existing because he had just been there. When he wrote these words, he had just been to Jerusalem and knew those people and had a fellowship with them, though they were not like him. And he certainly was not like them. You remember Paul, the blasphemer of the Holy Spirit? By the way, I got into a long string of thing on Facebook the other day that people that don't, that don't think Paul blasphemed the Holy Spirit, they don't know what the Holy Spirit does. If they don't think Paul blasphemed the Holy Spirit, there was 12 men filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. There was 3,000 people plus filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 4. And that's who the people that Paul was attacking. Them being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't seem to matter to people today who don't think Paul, he didn't really blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Yes, he did five times. And frankly, I don't care if you believe that or not. That's a, between you and the Lord. Now, here's the thing. He knows those people are out there. Peter, James, and John. Uh, Peter, James, the Lord's brother, and John, and the rest of the 12 apostles. And only James, the brother of John, is the only one that had been killed at that time. And here's what he says in verse 16. As many as walk according to this rule, as in chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, as in chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. As in the other things that he has applied to these people here in Galatia. As many as walk according to this rule, peace on them and mercy. And upon the Israel of God. There they are. That's the Israel of God right there. In Galatians 6, he's not making a reference to the, to the church that you and I are in being the Israel of God. But there are people that believe that. So they call that a replacement theology. I don't think that's too good a uh, terminology, but then I wasn't choosing that, so I guess it's none of my business. So then, what is the mystery of godliness? Well, turn back to the First Timothy chapter 4. The first identifying mark that we can find in the verse, verse 16, the first identifying mark is God was manifest in the flesh. So the mystery of godliness is in, is in the habit of identifying God being manifest in the flesh. That it, it, it's not, it's not that God being manifest, God was manifest in the flesh is not the mystery of godliness. It's one of the aspects that show you what the mystery of godliness is. So the so the uh, connection there to Jesus Christ is obvious. God was manifest in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, now I'm going to do this uh, on a collective basis here, uh, so to speak, because there is also a thing there that says um, justified in the spirit. The very next phrase of it says justified in the spirit. Well, I know that that's Jesus Christ too. Look, if you will, at God being manifest in the flesh, in a sense. Look in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3. John the Baptist is preaching, and he's uh, uh, somewhere along the River Jordan. And in verse 13, it says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Why would John say that? 
because he knew who it was that was approaching him. Hold on there and go to John chapter 1. Look at the book of John chapter 1. In verse 29, it again is about John baptizing. In verse 29 of John chapter 1, the Bible says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. Based upon prophecy. They all knew, though meaning the Jews, they all knew that was the Messiah. So God was manifest in the flesh in that light. But now go back to Matthew chapter 3 again. And notice that he's justified in the spirit here in the same sense. Um, so John says, I need to be baptized of you. But that's not what Jesus is going to allow here. Verse 15 and Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, the justified in the Spirit for Jesus, if you're saying God was man in the flesh, manifest in the flesh and that was Jesus yes it was just like he was manifest there behold the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world here it's just, and you could have done the same thing in John I think almost exactly the same thing uh, the Spirit of God is descending like a dove it's not looking like a dove you know it's one of the reasons people get in trouble about the bride of Christ they, know, they forget what a, what a simile is a simile is making a likeness, not seeing a picture. It's comparing something. You know, like he has the roar of a lion. Well, was he a lion or did he just roar? See, that's that's a that's a simile. And the same thing's true about the spirit of God descending like a dove. If you have never watched the dove de descend, I'm sorry for you. They land in my backyard a lot. And I see them. I watch them land. And I think about that a lot. The point is that justified in the Spirit is easy to see from the testimony of John the Baptist. It would be easy to see justified in the Spirit uh, by other things that the Spirit of God does in Jesus as, as in the sense of uh, miracles and things like that. So that in saying that's Jesus, that would be a good thing to say, but that isn't all because we're not talking about Jesus himself here. We're talking about the mystery of godliness. Now, for the mystery of godliness to be uh, manifest in the flesh, it has to do with, You know, I just realized that I'm going, to, I'm going to say this in about two and a half minutes, and really I'll spend 40 minutes on this subject. It has to do with the fact that once a person's saved, they can't get lost. God being manifest in the flesh, <laughs> whether you like it or not, my friend, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, that's me and you. The only manifestation of God in the flesh is we who speak his words. For instance, look in Romans chapter 10. Romans 10. This is an almost disconnected verse to make the point. Start with me in verse uh, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the Lord uh, the, the gospel. For, I was, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. Now watch the concluding verse. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Go to 1 Corinthians 
chapter 1, just the next verse over, next book over, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse uh, 17, Paul writes, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Verse 21, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Second Timothy chapter 4, he tells Timothy, preach the word, be it in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why is he talking about that? He's talking about the mystery of godliness bringing justification in the flesh. God is manifest in the flesh. How do you do that? Well, look in Colossians chapter 1. Look in Colossians 1. You see, folks, this is not about some easy believism for the purpose of understanding why we're here. This is about all that God said to us. This is what the Lord wants us to say. He didn't want our words. He wants his word. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Notice he says here, this is great. Verse 27. It's about the fulfillment of the mystery. It says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Ain't that something? Yes, it is something. God was manifest in the flesh by that which would manifest him in the flesh. And it has to do with words speaking words and i know they can be written and people can and sign language and whatever whatever it takes to communicate it's the words folks now notice the next phrase in the mystery of godliness is uh, justified in the spirit well how could that be us well first of all look in romans chapter 5 romans 5 i know i'm going fast just write down the words if you haven't got time to, to chase them all down here uh go back to them Notice here in uh, Ro uh, Romans chapter 5, actually we're going to read 4, verse 24 and 25, and then we're going to read in 5. Chapter 4, verse 24, but for us also to whom it, that's righteousness, shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Justified in what? Keep reading. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we have glory in tribulations also, knowing that uh, tribulation work with patience, and patience experience, experience hope. Now watch. Verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Did you see that? We've got the Holy Ghost given unto us, justified in the Spirit. Notice, if you will, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians, next book over, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 9, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. We have the spirit of God. In having the spirit of God, we know the things of God that other people can't know. And the rest of that chapter will bear that out. That isn't all. Look in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, I have a hard time knowing where to start here with this, but let's start with uh, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5.
For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. There's a great correlation here between God being manifest in the flesh and justified in the spirit and um, that coming to apply to something besides simply the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, notice this. So then death worketh in uh, verse 11, for we which are alive are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you, we having the same spirit of faith. According as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. David said that. We also believe and therefore speak. Now, what you think about that in your own situation, in your own life, sometimes I'm willing to, to uh, lay odds this is true. Start to say bad, better not do this. People think you are mysterious. If you talk about the Lord in light of the church, the body of Christ, in light of belonging to the Lord, people are going to think you are mysterious. You know, uh, not too long after I was exposed to the truth of God's word by the practice of rightly dividing the word truth in study, two of my friends were discussing me without me being there. And uh, one of them got come back and told me what the other one said. He said, I just believe old Jerry's learned too much. <laughs> uh, in the first place, could anybody do that? No, I don't. I don't think so. But that's what he that's what he, he wanted to get a point. The point across was I believe Jerry's learned too much. Mm. Ah. Notice in, in um, uh, 2 Second Corinthians 5, along subject doesn't change. You know, I mean there's several aspects of it going on here, but the subject doesn't change. We're talking about being justified in the spirit now. He says. In, in, as, as concerning that new body that's coming down out of heaven and belongs to us and when it gets here and so on and so forth. Verse 5. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5, 5. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, and I'll leave the rest of that for right now, but go back to chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 20, for all the promises of God in him, Christ, are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which establisheth us with you is in Christ, and hath anointed us, is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Sealed. I love that sound. Look in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. He says to these people, he says uh, concerning himself and other people before him, that we should be, verse 12, sorry, Ephesians 1, verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, under the praise of his glory. Now notice that spirit. Sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And look with me in chapter 2. Ephesians 2. He's talking about the two groups being brought together. The first people who trusted in Christ and the second people who trusted in Christ. Says you're going to be, he's going to make up in, in himself of 21 new man. Now notice verse 16. 
and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit into unto the Father. You see, there's that Holy Spirit again. Now, if you will look in chapter um, four, in chapter four, verse three. Paul writes, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's seven aspects of the Spirit here, the unity of the Spirit, I mean. And it's the unity of the Holy Spirit, because you got it. If you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit. Verse uh, 4, there is one body and one Spirit, even as you're calling one hope, you're calling one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, above all, and through all and in you all. Now, there's that spirit connection again. Now, notice over in chapter 4, when he's giving instructions to us, you and me, we are in Ephesians chapter 4, biggest daylight. He says to us, verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed under the day of redemption. You've got the Holy Spirit. Look in uh, uh, Philippians, look in Philippians chapter mm -hmm. Well, I may be wrong about Philippians. I may have had a different verse in mind. I think I did. Uh, look, well, I know it's in Colossians. Look in Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, the idea of God the Father has made us partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. In verse 12. God the Father, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. And so there in like we, we are there in that kingdom, and we possess that spirit. And I still can't find the verse I'm looking for, so I've probably got it screwed up in my mind someplace. But nevertheless, we are justified in the Holy Spirit. I know one verse that we can go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And that, that spirit that he's given us is manifold. It had, in other words, it has many aspects to it. And this, here's the thing. Verse 7 of 2 Timothy chapter 1, he says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but, if you will allow me to, break, to, to build the compound, compound sentence back and not shorten it, but... God hath given us the spirit of power, but God hath given us the spirit of love, and but God hath given us the spirit of a sound mind. So all of those would be attached to or in, a, in accord with the Holy Spirit of God. Now notice, if you will, in verse, uh, same chapter, look in verse um, 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. On and on it goes, teaching us that we are justified in the Spirit. Now, just flip back to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3 again, and uh, we could have gone here to see that Spirit speaking to us in chapter 4 pretty easily, but we're going to see something else real quickly. We're going to run out of time. Now, when in the, in the understanding that Great, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness in verse 16, chapter 3, verse 16. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels. Well, I know that work with Jesus. Angels came and ministered to him. So it is Jesus the man as well, just as the other things are. But it's also us. Notice, if you will, in chapter 5, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels before God before the Lord Jesus Christ and before the elect angels. So we are being seen of angels. We are. Um, if you don't like this, you can take that up with God, but we are. Then if you, uh, the next phrase in uh, chapter 3, verse 16, is preached unto the Gentile. You know, it's fascinating to me. From Acts chapter 9 through 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul, being the apostle of the Gentiles, has made very clear. Most of those verses are just openly, that's his job. Go to Gentiles. Preaching to Gentiles. Teaching the Gentiles. Being the apostle of the Gentiles. All, all, almost all of those verses. 
The rest of them are also, because of the first bunch, they're, they're, it's abundantly clear. There's 18 verses that show you that Paul's the apostle of Gentiles. I want to ask you something. How old were you when you found that out? And if you get the idea that churches are not really hiding something for you, 18 times, folks. There are a lot of verses that are only in there once that I knew real well, especially when they asked me for a memory verse that Jesus wept. That's only in there one time. Be sure your sins will find you out. It was only in there one time. It is appointed unto man once to die, but and after that's the judgment. It's in there one time. Paul's the apostle of Gentiles. 18 times. Nobody knows it. You think I'm wrong? Start asking preachers. Start asking them. I don't care who they are. Like asking them for a testimony of salvation. That ought to tell you something. So, Paul did preach him unto the Gentiles. Paul did preach the church unto the Gentiles. Paul gave the whole picture of the whole thing unto the Gentiles. In fact, Paul described the church, which is the body of Christ, as a parenthesis in time, but he described it as not being that which is going on over here and done with that which was going on over here and seeing only the power of God in the cross to bring over the salvation into the church, the body of Christ. And as a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, preaching to Gentiles, explained all eight mysteries. We haven't got them all covered yet, but he explained all eight mysteries that God Almighty had revealed unto him. Every one of them has something to do with you. It has nothing to do with Israel, past or future. It has to do with the building of the body of Christ. And that's what this great mystery of godliness is. Believed on in the world, you believed it. I believed it. We know a few thousand people in this world that have believed the gospel of Christ, have placed them, have seen themselves being placed into the church, the body of Christ, in a spiritual sense, ready to be the next thing. Received up into glory. Christ was received up into glory. That is true. Just like I said, all of these aspects have to, they all apply to Christ the man, but they also apply to Christ the, the body. The body of Christ is going to be received up into glory. Received up into glory. Great is the mystery of Godless. Without controversy, great is the mystery of Godless. And I'm telling you, to the world today, they don't know about this. They don't know what I just went over. They have no idea how, how to go over that. And I realize I'm about as disjointed as it comes to it, getting all these things said. But of all these aspects of the mystery of godliness, every one of them has something to do with the church, the body of Christ. And then finally, of course, it is the church, the body of Christ is the thing that's taken off here. When we leave here, when this is gone, when we're gone, we go ever to be with the Lord. It will be as though this was never, ever interrupted. All of that will be joined back together. The church, the body of Christ. Wow, great is the mystery of godliness. I thank you for being here today. I hope it's not too disjointed to understand. And I hope that, uh, that you can uh, uh, gain something from it. By your own study, you'll gain a lot more from, than from listening to me, I'm sure. So... Uh, and by the way, let me just tell you that we remind you that we will not have a Bible class here next Sunday afternoon at four. I'll be down in uh, Pensacola, Florida on Friday night uh, through Sunday morning. And uh, then I'm, I'm going on a further trip. So I'll be driving Sunday afternoon. Won't be anywhere I can do a Bible class. But you ought to have about 10 Bible classes from that Bible conference. If you don't know how to find that, look up Byron Wiggins on Facebook or uh, by, uh, some other way you can find out about Grace Churches. And when you get to Byron Wiggins Grace Church, and never, don't, don't depend on me to remember the name of that church, but look up Byron Wiggins, and, uh, and his church will show you how you can see all of those videos next week, on um, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, and Sunday morning. I thank you all for being here. Look forward to seeing you at this particular juncture in two weeks. Good night, everybody.